Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. You know, as we speak, Russia is pushing deeper into Ukraine. Israel is attacking Hamas in Gaza. And the Houthis are firing anti-ship ballistic missiles at merchant shipping in the Red Sea, which, as we all know, is where 12% of the world's commerce passes through. You know, a black swan event used to be something that was really rare and unusual. But in this case, black swan events seem to have been happening with the frequency that we see black crows. So this is like, you know, we're living in an era of where black swans have become black crows, and that's the world that we are in today. And India, fortunately, is the lighthouse in this sea, this stormy sea that we've faced with. You just heard the AV, the world's fastest growing major economy, beacon of hope for the rest of the world, the developing country that shows the promise of being in the top three economies of the world by the end of this decade. And I have with me today a very distinguished panel who's going to be telling us how we're going to get there and how the world sees us. And I want to welcome Mr. Sanjeev Sanyal, who's just running. <laughs> welcome, Mr. Sanyal, just in time. But we'll start a little differently. You know, uh, there are these little envelopes that I've uh, put by your side. They've got your names on it. I'd request all of you to open it and see what's inside. This is a return gift, but I'm giving it out a little early. So it's, uh, whoops, <laughs> right, okay. Jody, what do you have there? Something that matches your outfit. I know, I know. That. It's a red dragon. It's a red dragon, ah, yeah. It's a yeah. year of the dragon. Yeah, thanks. It's a year of the dragon. And you know, Jody, I want to talk about where India and Australia were about 26 years back when the Pokhran tests happened. Some of the biggest condemnation of the tests came from Australia, right? And we were a little shocked here in India. I said, why is Australia criticizing us? You know, what have we got against them? But 26 years later, here we are. It's one of the best, fastest moving relationships. I hear nothing but good words for Australia. But, you know, when I look at the numbers, the India-Australia bilateral is just 20 billion. And we have to talk about the dragon in the room. Your bilateral with China is 200 billion. Why do you bet on the uh, India story? Why do you think that's the next big thing for you in Australia? Yeah, well, f firstly, uh, the Red Dragon is a nice touch, thank you. Um, and as soon as I opened it, I knew you wanted to talk to me about China. I appreciate that. Uh, but here I'm talking about India. And uh, I always get asked about the India versus China. And for me, you can't choose India just because China isn't working. You actually have to uh, choose India because India is the best place for your business. Um, Australia yeah, let's hear has... that. India is the best place. <laughs> Australia has traditionally had a, uh, a relationship, obviously, with China. You mentioned the figures. Uh, our two-way trade with China is about 250 billion, and with India, it's 26 billion. Uh, but as you said, the friendship between uh, India and Australia is flourishing. And we've seen a huge effort by both governments to put the architecture in place to make sure we have those economic um, uh, those economic effects uh, that will actually take this relationship further. And that relates to primarily the free trade agreement which came into place. So we're the first country, the first Western country in 10 years to engage in a free trade agreement with India. And we are very pleased to be in that. Um, so I think that with the free trade agreement, you are going to see the economic relationship turn around as well. It's not just about cricket. It's not just about Australia being the first country to acknowledge India's independence. I think that the government has made a huge effort uh, in putting the architecture in place to see this relationship uh, go further. I acknowledge that uh, Tony Abbott, the former Prime Minister, is in the room and I pay tribute to him 
because uh, Tony Abbott has been so critical in being able to see this relationship go forward. But uh, apart from the World Cup, is it too early to, to mention the World Cup? Well, let's not talk about the World Cup, Jody. <laughs> I mean, I'm very sensitive. But other than that, you know, yeah. it's really yeah. positive for India and Australia. And thank you for my dragon. Right. But Sanjeev, uh, that, that, that was a, a nice touch there. Uh, betting on India. Sanjeev, you know, last year we inaugurated the new parliament and one of the, the best touches there was the Sengal, right, which the Prime Minister installed there. Now the Cholas had India's biggest maritime empire and you're a student of history, you're an author, I've read your book, Ocean of Churn. What can the Cholas teach us about trading in the Indo-Pacific? Well, thank you very much for having me here today. And let me say that, uh, not just the Cholas, Cholas were actually rather late in our history, only 1000 uh, AD or so. So if you go back another, over the previous several thousand years, India had enormous uh, maritime uh, activities throughout the Indian Ocean. We are, after all, the only country in the world which has an ocean named after us. Absolutely. And so, even 1500 years, 2000 years before the Cholas, uh, we were sailing all over the Indian Ocean. And once you begin to take a maritime view of the world, we begin to see something completely different. So by the way, my, my gift is a ship. So, uh, so uh, clearly I've been given a maritime clue. But you see, if you, take a, if you sit here in Delhi and take a landlocked view of the world, then your neighbors are our friendly neighbor to the west and another friendly neighbor to our northeast. Right. But if you take a maritime view of the world, we have very different neighbors. Right. Uh, we have Oman and UAE on one side, you have Singapore and Indonesia on the other side, and yes, Australia too is a neighbor because in a maritime sense, uh, Australia is a neighboring country. It's an Indian Ocean country. We have historically thought of Australia as a Pacific country. But in fact, it is the second largest Indian Ocean economy. Uh, we have growing links with it. And uh, so this is one mental cobweb we had to get out of this landlocked view and move to a maritime view. But there were many other mental cobwebs we, we ourselves had to get rid of. And since you mentioned the new parliament um, and the Sengol and so on. So at one level, we are going back to an earlier era of maritime worldview. And the other way, we are also breaking out of a colonial era view of landlocked view of that we had got for ourselves. So in a sense, it's more than symbolic. So the, since we were discussing Australia before this, let me say that, you know, we've got to get on with this cricket and Commonwealth view of Australia or New Zealand and many of the other countries in the world. Uh, we have other interesting things to do. Uh, there's trade, there's artificial intelligence, there's finance, there is a new and growing um, uh, Indian community in Australia. And, you know, there are many other things uh, from the Quad to, you know, other kinds of things that we can uh, trade and co collaborate on. Absolutely. A different view of India when you look at the oceans uh, away from landlocked New Delhi. But Mukesh, you have a, a red cap. I wonder what that means. Do you want to talk about <laughs> where the Indo-US relationship will go? What is the trajectory? You know, I was, this book by Dennis Cooks, Estranged Democracies. For the longest time, one of the most bizarre aspects of this was the fact that India and US, the largest democracies, were on opposite sides in opposite camps. And today we are strategic partners, right? The, Bilateral trade is over $200 billion. Do you think that this trajectory is going to be altered by the Donald Trump presidency if it comes in because of the unpredictability it brings in? Or is there a consensus in the establishment in the US? Well, you have to understand uh, India is a rising power. And one day it's going to be a great power. So that's a given. And uh, when you look at the U.S.-India relationship, it's geopolitically aligned, it's economically aligned, it's from a technology perspective aligned, 
and also from people to people. We have around 5 million Indian Americans in the US, making roughly 1.5% of the population, but producing 6% of the GDP of the country. When you look from a geopolitics perspective, uh, basically US India sees China as a threat. And from that perspective, both countries are aligned. The Quad, which is taking place in partnership with Japan, Australia, India, and US, is moving in the right direction. You have I2U2 on the Western side, basically, where you have Israel, UAE, India, and the United States. And now we have announced the IMAC corridor, which is India, Middle East, and Europe. So to answer your question, I think the interest shifts. And at the moment, India is a star because the interests are aligned. 10 years from now, 20 years from now, it, it may shift. So that's why it's important that India basically on its own becomes self-sufficient. And I think that the two principles which are driving the relationship between India and the US, one is the economic prosperity of India by US is seen is good for America. Because as the purchasing power of people go up, they're going to procure more and more US goods and services. Education, we have 270,000 Indian students contributing over $9 billion. And the second aspect of the relationship is driven by military. US believes that a military strong India is good for regional stability. So that means you basically get off India from Russian platform, make, make it more make in India itself. And we believe strongly as time goes by, India will become a very strong net exporter of defense equipment competing on a global basis. So to answer your question, this relationship will flourish. If President Trump comes in, he was there earlier, the relationship was good. We had Obama, Trump, and Biden. So I think regardless of which president comes and goes, the relationship will continue in a positive trajectory. Right, absolutely. I see uh, Dr. Vivek Lal there in the front row. He's heaved a sigh of relief when you said that. <laughs> uh, he's uh, the head of General Atomics. Just sold us a whole lot of MQ-9 Reapers one of the largest defense deals, no US defense deals. But Andrew, I want to come to you, and uh, I, I want you to hold up what you pull out of that bag there. It says it's Vietnam. Vietnam. <laughs> now, you know, Defense Minister George Fernandez, about 25 years back, he said, in my next life, I want to be reborn as a Vietnamese person, because Vietnam is the only country in the 20th century that's defeated probably three of the five permanent members of the UN Security Council. That was the military side of it. And today you're looking at, in 2024, when you're talking of China plus one, Vietnam is attracting record FDI inflows. What can Vietnam teach India in 2024? I, again, I think, you know, you go China plus plus one, uh, Vietnam, what can they teach India? I don't, I don't really think we need to be taught anything, to be honest. Um, you know, in my view, there's been a few things happened over the last month or so, which I think will have boardrooms around the world saying, what is our India strategy? And uh, there's two things that I noticed. One, BAT Industries said that they'd monetize a stake in ITC. The share price of BAT went up 11% that single day. Hyundai said they might list their, uh, subs uh, their uh, company in, in, in India. That would be something like a $30 billion market cap. That's 50% of their own market cap in Korea. And I can, you know, for uh, BAT, it's 30%. For Hindustan Lever, it's 30% of their overall holding in India of the total market cap of the global company. So when you come to India, it's not just that the fact that you've got the opportunity of the, the fantastic growth that we're going to be showing, but if you list, you also get uh, a huge market capitalization, which will help your share price in your home country. So I think this is a, is a new angle, uh, which I think a lot of boardrooms will be talking about. Now imagine if Samsung, Apple, Amazon, all list in India, what would that mean? So it's, I think, the opportunity for India. In terms of our growth, it's there anyway. But I don't think we should be looking at what Viet, Viet, Vietnam is doing or what China is doing. We have our own story. We have our own story. In fact, uh, and Jody, 
the point that Sanjeev mentioned that we should actually get beyond this Commonwealth game of, uh, you know, uh, Commonwealth view of India and Australia, it's more than just about cricket. When is that free trade agreement coming through, you think? And how hard has Australia worked for it? Uh, what was the question? Sorry. The, oh, the free thing. trade agreement, the India-Australia free trade agreement. The free trade agreement, yes. That's really important, actually. Um, that has been fundamental, uh, fundamentally changed the relationship between Australia and India in an economic sense. So as I mentioned, Australia and India have had a long friendship and uh, there has been, um, well, there is great pride that uh, we have an Indian diaspora. It's about a million strong in a 25 million uh, population. They're very proud of being Indian. They're very proud of being Australian and they've played a huge role as the living bridge between the two countries. But the free trade agreement is about the economic relationship and we have to go beyond, as you said, beyond uh, cricket, beyond curry uh, and we have to go beyond just seeing it as a people-to-people -people relationship because it is about trade and investment and both governments have indicated this is a priority for them. Uh, we mentioned that our uh, trade with India is about um, it's about $26 billion. Uh, we mentioned that our trade with China is about $250 billion. What the ECTA agreement is doing is targeting those sectors where there is massive advantage to be gained. Australia has given up most of its tariffs, either reduced or eliminated. Uh, India has given up about 85% of its tariffs. So there is still some way for us to go. The seeker agreement is uh, being negotiated now. We had hoped that that would be signed by the end of last year. It's still underway. It's hoped that we'll see that by the end of this year. So we are seeing a movement in trade. What we're not seeing is a movement in investment. So our investment into India is 19 billion. Our investment into the UK is 580 billion. So we've still got this massive gap that the free trade agreement hasn't been able to resolve. And that is an effort that will require both governments and the private sector working hard in SICA, so it is on the table in SICA, working hard in SICA to see it change. But I mentioned the architecture has been a priority for both governments. Um, the CEO forum which I run is about bringing in the corporate sector. I'm national chair of the Australian Indian Business Council. That's the, that's the SMEs in a bilateral chamber. We've set up a Centre for Australia-India Relations. We've got the ECTA agreement. We've got SICA underway. But we've still got a problem with investment and that requires the private sector. I think government has done its thing now. It's, it's really up to the private sector it's to step up. It's time for the private sector to kick And uh, Nilesh, my apologies, I was to come to you earlier, but with your little gift there, uh, it's your favorite subject. If you could just hold it up. The <laughs> it's red tape. Is that what's holding us back, Nilesh? You know, I was talking to my, uh, the plastic merchant in my uh, neighborhood and he told me that he registered a, a business in Turkey in 24 hours and he's importing stuff from there. When can we get to a time when we can start importing, you know, uh, registering businesses in 24 hours? So undoubtedly red tape to India is what is on-site betting to Saurav Ganguly. Right. Saurav Ganguly is India's greatest left-hand batsman. 113 test, 7,212 run, 42 average. But if Saurav Ganguly was as big a Maharaj on onside as he was on the offside, his statistics will be bread benefits, 113 test, 14,400 runs, and 84 average. Let me tell where the red tapism comes. Supreme Court based on a PIL, filed for an incidence, unfortunate incidence, which occurred in a dark, unlit parking lot of Delhi. 
ordered to remove all the sunscreen films which were levied, which were pasted on the car windows because the colonial motor vehicle leg like, did not provide for fixing films on the car windows. These films were helping us save about 10,000 crore rupees a year right. as heat was not getting into the car and AC burden was less. It's now two decades and we haven't yet changed the law. And the company which introduced sunscreen films in India is now exporting to 57 other nations, helping save them petrol cost, helping save them environment, and this is preventing them from selling in India. We are Saurav Ganguly, right. but if we start playing on the onside like we are playing on offside, we will be Donald Bradman. <laughs> Donald Bradman or maybe Virat Kohli for that. That's a great analogy. And I had a bet with Andrew about Andrew said that you're going to get in some cricket analogy for sure. <laughs> and, but you know, this, uh, Sanjeev, this thing about uh, judicial reforms, the, the whole thing of cases taking 10 and 15 years to uh, see, uh, you know, resolution in India, how important is that for business to flourish, how, for investment to come in? Well, <clears throat> fixing the judicial. I'm not a cricket fan, so I didn't quite catch the analogy. <laughs> but I can tell you that the ju discussing the judiciary is definitely one of my favorite activities. I mean, we are in an absurd situation where 50 million cases are stuck in the system. Why are higher courts go on summer vacation, the Sera vacation, winter vacation? This is a completely absurd system. So it's quite obvious that we need a modern judiciary which can keep up with our highways and airports and all the other modern infrastructure that we are building needs to have a judicial infrastructure that is just as good. Unfortunately, what we have is not even British era, but a medieval era, uh, uh, you know, judiciary where you have to send a prayer to their lordship. Right. I mean, you've got to be kidding me uh, that we have to have the very terminology we use tells you that the whole system is outdated. So we need to really get our act together and upgrade two things. One is our judiciary, and the other thing you mentioned, our administrative system. These are the two big areas of reform right. that we need to do over the next decade or so. You see, the last 25, 30 years was about stopping the government from doing things right. it should not do. But the next decade or so should be about getting the government to do the things it should do. Right. And Delivery of justice is surely one of the things that the Indian state should be doing. Of course, the, because of separation of powers this is not something the legislature or the government can easily do. Ultimately, the judiciary itself will hopefully begin to get, out, get its act together. I mean, the government can help from outside, but ultimately the judiciary itself has to, you know, get its act together and do something about it. Judiciary has to get its act together. And do its, I, I mean, I, I like the way this discussion began from, uh, you know, uh, stitched sailing vessels and landed up in the judiciary. Obviously, the judiciary has to get into a, a speedboat mode, uh, Sanjeev. But uh, very quickly, we're completely out of time, uh, ladies and gentlemen. What is the one thing that you would want the next government to do? And very clearly, we know the Prime Minister Modi's government is coming back, as the opinion polls say. But I want you all to give me one quick suggestion on what this government needs to do to make India better for doing business for investment. Beginning with you, Andrew. You know, saying one thing is, is, is like you're going to solve all the problems which you just heard of. I, I think just keep doing more of the same. I mean, you know, stick to what we're doing, what the policies, what the reforms have been. Um, and, and, you know, investment from uh, foreign companies will come. It's, uh, you know, we talked about earlier today the right. electronic manufacturing sector. It's $30 billion. It's going to be $150 billion. Foreign companies as well as Indian companies will want so to continuity. be in that sector. Continuity. You're, you're, yes. you're advocating continuity. Jody, what would you like to see the government do? Uh, we'd like to thing? see seeker signed. 
So we want to see this second stage of the free trade agreement signed. I think that's really important in the India-Australia relationship. We're halfway there, so we'd like to see that signed. Uh, I think there's a view that it will get caught up now with the Indian election, but it's certainly something we'd like. Um, I think, you know, I spoke about investment. I think that is the area where there is uh, huge gains to be made that isn't necessarily covered under the ECTA, hopefully in the SECA. But for Australian companies looking at India, there is an opaqueness about India. Australian companies want certainty uh, about how they invest. They want to know the risk. They want to know when there will be political or bureaucratic intervention. They want to know what the approval process is. They want to know what the timeline is. Predictability. Mukesh, what would you like to see the next government do? What's the one thing that you... Well, the, uh, the trade between... Uh, U.S. India has gone up to $200 billion. Our vision is to take it to $500 billion or a trillion. I think it's time we convince the Biden administration to look at India from a trade deal perspective. I think once you do a trade deal, you see the acceleration of the trade. Right. Okay. So that's, uh, that's a to-do there. Sanjeev, what would you like to see? The well, I already government? told you. I be, I, well, I'll say two things which are linked. One is we need to do administrative reforms. And we need to do judicial reforms. This will take us 10 to 15 years. So it's not just about the next government. But what we started with the real economy in 1990s and are now getting the reaping the benefits of that in a big way, we now need to start the cycle of doing, getting the bureaucracy to go away from control to service delivery right. and to get the judiciary to take its, its role in society more seriously and actually deliver justice on time. Deliver justice on time, very important uh, point there. Mukesh, uh, sorry. Uh. So, I'll focus on the finance part. Right. In 21 years of this century, Indians have spent $373 billion for import of coal. Every year we import 1,000 tons of coal, export 300 tons of jewelry, 700 tons of gold goes into our Tijori and bank lockers. There is a gold smuggling. Right. Assuming that gold smugglers are not charitable organization, based on the gold seized at customs, the run rate of gold smuggling is about $7 billion a year. If you look at people traveling into India from Middle East and Singapore, they look like cousin brothers of Bappi Lahiri loaded with jewelry. <laughs> Put together, as Indians, have we put $500 billion in import of gold, silver, diamond jewelry, officially and unofficially? It's not a wild estimate. It's more than what foreign direct investment we have received. It's more than what foreign portfolio investment we have received. We have deprived our entrepreneurs of that capital. We are a patient who wants to grow his health, but instead of taking blood donation, is giving blood donation. So I hope government does something which can make this one and a half to two to two and a half trillion dollar worth of locked savings in the Tijoris and safe deposit lockers of India to the entrepreneurs of India. If we would have done that earlier, we would have already become five trillion dollar economy. Right. Don't be Bappi Lahiri, don't be Goldfinger. Bring that, uh, uh, unlock all that the gold reserves that India holds, our Fort Knoxes, into the economy. I'm afraid we're totally out of time here, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for that engaging session there. India is the land of opportunity, the fastest growing economy, the major economy in the world, the growth magnet, the lighthouse in the storm. But there are challenges, and my learned panelists have just told us what they are and what the next government should be looking at very seriously. Thank you very much for that engaging discussion. Thank you. Thank you, you very from much. The You'll be hearing it from Prime Minister Modi in a few hours from now. The vision for India and uh, what India thinks today. Uh, we're absolutely delighted to uh, be getting a new vision of his, uh, uh, you know, view of how India is going to be in the years ahead. Thank you very much. Thank Thanks. you very much, Sandeep. Thank you to all the panelists who've taken time out to be with and us here uh, today. And all those uh, thought-provoking uh, gifts as well. Let's not forget that. Uh, Shweta. Um, Sandeep, I do have a, a very uh, nice gift thought out for you as well, but uh, that'll have to wait for your birthday. <laughs>